It's my pleasure today to introduce Dieter Fox, who's going to be talking to us about probabilistic methods for mobile robot navigation. Um, Dieter received his PhD in 1998 from the University of Bonn and has since been doing a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. And he tells me that he's going to present a video today of a mobile robot navigating autonomously around the, one of the Smithsonian museums. So I'm really looking forward to that. Dieter? Thank you very much. So in this talk, I will present the application of probabilistic methods to some of the fundamental problems in mobile robot navigation. The first problem I will address is the one of mobile robot localization, where we try to determine the position of a mobile robot within its environment. After that, I will address the problem of map building, which is how can a mobile robot build a map or a model of its environment based on sensor data that it collects as it moves through the environment. After that, I will give two examples of the application of decision theoretic approaches to mobile robot control. And finally, I will draw the conclusions and talk about future work. On this slide, you see the very abstract view on a mobile robot control system. On the right side, you have the mobile robot as it is embedded into the environment. It is equipped with sensors such as cameras or um, ultrasound sensors with which it can detect obstacles in the environment. The robot can perform actions. It can move through the environment, that is, change its own position within the environment. If it is equipped with a manipulator, it can change the position of objects in the environment. And the, the goal of the control system is to um, control the robot so that it achieves a certain task. And in order to reason about changes in the environment in order to plan the control system has a world model, which is typically a map of the environment. And the problems in this context are mainly um, due to the uncertainty in the information that is given to the control system. On the one hand side, the sensor data that the robot collects with its own sensors um, is noisy, which means the robot will never get perfect information about the environment. At the next stage, the control system has to consider that the outcome of actions is uncertain, which means, for example, if you try to um, guide a robot to a certain room, then it might happen that the door is closed. Or typically, if you tell a robot to move one meter ahead, it might only move 95 centimeters. And finally, the world model is uncertain um, with several respects, which means, for example, it is mostly incomplete. It does also not cover the complete dynamics of the environment. And another source of uncertainty is the fact that the world model often is based on uncertain sensor data that the robot collects. And these problems do not only hold for these kind of mobile indoor robots, but they hold for any type of embedded computer system or computer system that is embedded in the environment. So you can think of, for example, uh, a car autonomously driving down a highway or um, an internet agent collecting um, data in the internet or intelligent environments that um, perceive um, the inhabitants of the environment and try to adapt to the needs of the um, inhabitants. And um, the key issue of this talk will be um, how to use probabilistic methods in order to deal with the uncertainty in this context. Here I just give you some examples of how this um, uncertain information, what it looks like. Um, on the left side you see a typical map as it is used nowadays for mobile robot navigation. It's a two-dimensional description of obstacles in the environment. So the black areas indicate, for example, walls, and the white areas in the map indicate free space where the robot can navigate. This map is about 24 meters wide. And as you can see already, that for example, at the lower end, this is um, usually a straight wall, but in the map, it is not represented as a nicely straight line. And the, the red line you see in this map is a typical path taken by the robot. And another problem in this context is given um, in this example, where you see the red path as it is measured by the wheel encoders of the robot. So a mobile robot is equipped with, with encoders on its wheel so that it can measure its own motion. And here you can see the, the path that the robot measured as it moved through the environment. 
So it started on the, on the upper right part, then moved down the hallway, and here already it kind of has an orientational error of 10 degrees. So you can imagine that if we would only um, depend on this kind of information, the robot would quickly lose track of its position in the environment. Another example of um, uncertain sensor information is given in this picture. Here you have the robot projected into a map, and these red lines are measurements taken with ultrasound sensors of the robot. So a robot is often equipped with ultrasound sensors which um, send out a wave of ultrasound, and by the time of flight, the distance to obstacles is measured. And what you can see here, for example, that on the right side, this wall is not detected at all by those two sensors. And at the same time, these sensors over here measure an obstacle that is not even in the map. Now you could argue that if we take better sensors, then these problems don't occur anymore. Here we have an example of a scan taken by a laser rangefinder. So the advantage of a laser rangefinder is it gives you um, very precise distance to obstacles. It is a light-based sensor, and it gives you um, a very high angular resolution about the position of obstacles. So now I could argue that, that this sensor is almost perfect and there's no uncertainty in this information. But if now, if we go to a different environment, then you can see that even this sensor has um, significant problems. Here you can see the black obstacles are those obstacles that are represented in a map of the environment. The red beams indicate here are the, um, the laser information that corresponds to those obstacles, and the blue beams are those that are caused by people standing around the robot. So even if you have a highly accurate sensor, there's still an uncertainty, and it is difficult to relate the sensor information to the model of the environment. And we found out that probabilistic methods are well suited to deal with this kind of um, uncertain sensor information. And now I want to give you two examples where we installed a mobile robot in a museum. It was the um, Deutsches Museum in Bonn, Germany. The task of the robot was to guide people through the exhibition. As you can see, the environment was highly dynamic, especially the people around it. Um, the people could interact with the robot. They could choose among different tours. The robot moved from exhibit to exhibit and gave verbal explanation about the different exhibits. And to do so autonomously, the robot was equipped with, with a map of the environment. It um, planned a path from one exhibit to the next exhibit, but at the same time, it had to um, quickly react to people that block its way. The cameras were not used in this project. They were only used to display the, um, the information that the robot collects. So people on the internet were able to get virtual tours through the museum. The The um, navigation was mainly based on proximity sensors, though uh, just the one I showed you, for example, the ultrasound sensors and laser range finders. There are many funny kinds of obstacles. And I can sh show you one example. Um, so in order to, to perform path planning and to get from one exhibit to the next exhibit, the robot has to know where it is. So usually it's, it's enough if the robot knows um, about plus minus 50 centimeters, one meter, where it is in order to perform such a task. But in this environment, we had an additional problem, and that is given by specific obstacles in the environment. So the laser range scanner of the robot um, scanned the environment for obstacles that were that high in the environment. And this obstacle down here, right in the center of the museum, only was so high. So the robot had to deal with obstacles that it couldn't detect with its sensors. And in order to avoid 
colliding with these obstacles, the robot had to know exactly where it is relative to these obstacles, which um, assumes that you know accurately where the robot is in its, in its map, and only then it is able to um, avoid collisions with these obstacles. In this experiment, we installed a kind of second generation tour guide robot, Minerva, in the National Museum of American History um, in Washington, D.C. The task of the robot was the same, to guide people through the exhibition. Now, as you can see, it was equipped with a kind of face, so it could um, give different um, verbal explanations again, show different moods. The environment was even more hostile than the first one. <laughs> we didn't force a kid to, to do so, though it really happened. Maybe, maybe America versus German environments, I don't know. <laughs> so here you can see again the robot was able to detect dynamic obstacles in its way. And the longer you block, then finally it started frowning and got angry and once got out of the way, it was happy again. And yeah. <laughs> so in the empty museum, it uh, moved pretty fast with 1.6 meters per second. That was when people were able to guide it over the internet. Okay, I hope I convinced you that, that accurate position estimation is one of the major preconditions for the success of such systems. In the next part of the talk, I want to introduce um, the problem of mobile robot localization. I will first talk about Markov localization, which is a kind of general framework for this kind of probabilistic position estimation. And then I will introduce Monte Carlo localization, which is one specific implementation of this idea. And here you see the, the general idea of Markov localization. So imagine um, the world is one dimensional. In this case, it is a hallway. The robot is equipped with a map of the hallway and the map tells it where the doors are. In the beginning, the robot is placed in the hallway but it is not told where it is. And this uncertainty is given by this uniform distribution over the belief state of the robot. And the next thing the robot can do is um, try to make perceptions about the environment. In this case, let's assume it um, detects a door to its left. And what happens to the belief state is that the probability of being close to a door is increased while the probability of being somewhere else, for example in front of a wall, is decreased. But it should be noted that for this kind of global localization problem, the robot has to be able to represent ambiguous situations because based on one observation, it is not able to distinguish these three doors. In this example, the next robot can do is just move, in this case, one or two meters ahead. And what happens to this distribution is first, it is shifted according to the measured motion. And because the motion information is uncertain, this um, distribution is convolved. It, so the robot gets more uncertain about its position when it moves. And finally, imagine the robot again detects the door to its left. And if this information is integrated into this belief state, then finally the robot can uniquely determine where it is. But at the same time, the probability of being anywhere else is non-zero because the sensor information might be wrong. And we can state this problem as, as one of um, state estimation, where where the state of the system is the position of the robot within its environment. And this is modeled by a three-dimensional random variable. And it's three-dimensional because we want to know the XY position of the robot and its orientation within the environment. And the ingredients we have for the state estimation problem is first a map and a sensor model. And what the sensor model tells us, what is the probability of making an observation given that the robot is at a specific location L, which means what's the probability of detecting a door given the different locations in the map. For example, the probability of detecting a door is higher if the robot actually stands in front of a door. The next model is the one that describes the motion of the robot. 
And this probabilistic term here shows what is the probability of the robot ending up at a location L, given that it previously has been at a location L prime and measured the motion A. So this is kind of, in the previous example, this is the model that describes how the state of the robot changes when it moves. So this is kind of uh, the shifting of the probability distribution at the same time the convolution. And finally, we need to have um, certain knowledge about the initial state of the robot. And if, for example, we know nothing about the start position of the robot, then this, this initial state is mod modeled by a uniform distribution over the entire environment, just like we had in the previous example. And typically, what happens if you know um, the start position of the robot, then this is modeled by a Gaussian distribution with mean at this estimated starting position. And finally, as a robot moves through the environment, it collects a stream of sensor data. And this sensor data um, consists of sensor information about the environment, collected by, by cameras, for example, or sonar, ultrasound sensors, or laser range finders, and um, by odometry information about the motion of the robot. And what we are interested in is at a certain point in time is the posterior distribution over the belief state of the robot collected all data, uh, given all data that the robot has collected thus far. And this um, posterior probability is often referred to as the belief of the robot. In order to compute this belief, um, we face a the problem that this term gets arbitrarily complex because the number of conditioning variables increases over time. But fortunately, we can make um, the so-called Markov assumption. And this assumption means in this context that the probability of making a certain observation only depends on the current position of the robot. In other words, given the position of the robot, the probability of making an observation is independent of all other data that the robot has collected before that point in time. And the other assumption is that the probability of the robot um, being at a certain location only depends on its previous position and the action that it performed in between. Yeah. Previous actual position or previous belief position? So it stated, so the assumption is given its actual position. But since you, you estimate a, compu uh, a distribution over those positions, it is the same as a belief. But in this assumption, you state given its actual position. And you don't distinguish between the belief and the actual position anymore because you have just a distribution over this belief state. How, how reasonable are those assumptions? Um, so in other words, this assumption means that you have a perfect model of the environment, which means um, that you know all about the dynamics of the environment and the robot position is the only state that affects sensor data. Um, in static environments, it's very reasonable. In dyna um, dynamic environments such as the museum, um, I introduced a sensor filter which filters out sensor data that is corrupted by the dynamics of the environment. Um, but typically in, in the applications, as you will see, um, this assumption is pretty reasonable. And if we make these assumptions here, then we can come up with a very efficient incremental scheme to compute the belief of the robot for the different positions in the environment. And this means, this is almost the same that we saw on, on the first slide about the localization, which means whenever the robot mo moves, the belief of being at a location L is given by the probability of ending up at location L given that the robot previously has been at a position L prime and measured motion A. And this is um, integrated over the whole previous belief of the robot. And what this does is nothing else than this kind of shifting the distribution and again con con convolving it. And whenever the robot makes a perception, the belief of being at a location L is changed proportional to the probability of making the observation at this position L. 
which means the belief of standing in front of a door is increased if the robot detects a door. And the belief of standing in front of a wall is decreased if the robot detects a door. And up to now, so what we need for this kind of state estimation is we need a motion model and we need a model um, of, of the sensors of the robot. What I haven't talked about thus far is um, how we represent the belief state of the robot. So we have a three-dimensional random variable and we need to um, model arbitrary distributions over this belief state. And this slide I want to talk about the different state representations, state space representations that are typically used in mobile robot localization. The most popular one is the one um, coming from the area of Kalman filters where you assume that the uncertainty in the robot position can be represented by a unimodal Gaussian distribution. The advantage of these approaches is that they are very efficient and provide highly accurate position estimates. The disadvantage is that you cannot solve the global localization problem because you cannot represent um, ambiguous uh, situations during global localization. More recently, um, two groups introduced um, the application of multi-hypothesis tracking approaches to this problem, where you um, assume that you can model the uncertainty in the robot position by a mixture of Gaussians, and each of these Gaussians is tracked using a Kalman filter. And these approaches, in principle, can solve the global localization problem. And in our group um, at the University of Bonn, we introduced a different um, representation for this three-dimensional state space, which is based on a um, three-dimensional grid or a piecewise constant approximation of this distribution. And typically, in our environment, um, we discretize the environment by, by patches that are about 15 by 15 centimeters big. And in each of those grid cells, we store the probability that the robot is at this corresponding location. The advantage of this um, representation is that, again, we can um, globally localize a robot. The disadvantage is um, the memory requirements because you need to maintain this big three-dimensional grid in memory. And in, we use this approach in the National Museum of American History, and we needed, I think, more than 200 megabytes of storage only for this grid. More recently, um, we modeled this um, grid by um, an octree representation where you adapt the representation to the probability that the robot is at certain positions in the space. And this is a more compact representation than the, grid, than the previous one. And finally, other groups um, introduced this kind of um, piecewise constant representation over a topological map of the environment. Here, the, the model of the environment is given by a graph and the different nodes in the graph are distinctive places like hallway crossings or positions in front of doors. And the nodes in, uh, and the edges in the graph um, correspond to hallways in the environment. The advantage here, again, is these approaches can in principle um, solve the global localization problem. It's a very compact representation of the environment, but the disadvantage is that it only gives you um, a pretty coarse information about the position of the robot. And this talk, I want to introduce a different representation for this um, state space of the robot, and this comes from the area of particle filters. And the idea here is that we represent the belief state of a robot by samples that are drawn from this belief state. And these particle filters are not new. They have been introduced for the estimation of non-Gaussian, non-linear dynamic processes. The nice property of these particle filters is that the approximation of the true posterior um, converges to the true density at a rate of one over square root of n, where n is the number of samples. Um, these particle filters have been known under different names. For example, um, the survival of the fittest has been introduced by Daphne Koller's group in the area of dynamic belief networks. And maybe the most popular name is a condensation algorithm used in computer vision by Isard and Blake, where they use this algorithm to track contours in a sequence of um, video images. 
And using the same example that I used in the beginning, now I want to introduce the idea of these particle filters. So imagine, again, we have a one-dimensional environment, and in the beginning, the robot does not know where it is. This uncertainty is represented by just drawing samples uniformly over this one-dimensional state space. So each of those red lines corresponds to one sample, which is one hypothetical position for the robot. Now imagine the robot detects a door to its left. So now we have this sample set, and we have the detection of the door, which is here given by the probability of making this observation at the different locations in the environment. If you look at the right, these are exactly the positions of the three doors. And now we want to generate a sample set that corresponds to the posterior belief given this observation. And this is done using important sample, sampling. And in, in important sampling, what we do is we weight the samples according to the probability of making the observation at the different positions. So this now corresponds to a weighted sample set. Yeah? What's the significance? It looks to me as if there's thicker lines in some places. Is that just thicker lines, or is there more lines? Um, that's only the display. Oh, oh, do you think about the red one or, yeah, or this here? focusing on the, on the height of the lines or on the, on the density of the lines? Are you talking about the yes. red one? The red ones. That's because we randomly draw them. So they're all the same with all lines. It's just several lines pretty close to each other then. OK? Hmm? Where does the uh, probability information come from for when you detect the door from this perspective? That sounds like a lot of data that can be made up to make the system work. Um, in this example, so that's a very abstract example, it is very easy. So if you assume that the robot has a sensor that helps it detecting doors, then um, this distribution here can be easily ex extracted from this map. So you just want, you just derive that right from the map. Right from the map, yeah. And we do this with our sensor models as well. Okay, so in the current state now we have a weighted sample set. But what we want to have is a sample set where all samples are equally weighted. And this is done by drawing samples from this sample set again um, with, with probability proportional to the weight, which means samples that have a high weight are drawn with, more pro with higher probability than samples in this area. And samples are drawn with replacement. And this results in this new sample set down here, which in, uh, includes the same number of samples as the upper one, only that here we have many copies of those samples because they have a high probability. And now the next robot does is, again, it, it moves forward. And what we do is we pick each of those samples and draw a new sample according to the motion model of the robot. And this results in the sample set you see here. So now we already see that we have three clusters of samples with high density. And those correspond to the three high probability areas in the upper figure. Now again, in this example, the robot detects a door to its left. So what we do to integrate this observation, again, we use important sampling and get this weighted sample set again. And when we draw from this weighted sample set, then we get finally this sample set with equal weights. And now you see that almost all the samples are concentrated on this position in the map, which corresponds to the true position of the robot. But there are still other samples in the area because there's a non-zero probability of the robot being there. And to sum up, the idea of this kind of Monte Carlo localization is to represent the belief of the robot by samples. Each sample is given by a possible position of the robot and a weight. And the sample set is um, initialized according to the prior knowledge about the robot position, for example, a uniform distribution. And whenever the robot moves, we pick the sample and um, shift them according to the motion model of the robot. And, yeah? Uh, on this 
experiments we're just showing, were you assuming that you had perfect information from your door sensor and also perfect knowledge of the map where you expect it to be? Oh. You were just unsure of your location? This, no, typically you, don't, you do not assume that. So for example, this can be done that there is a non-zero probability of detecting a door even if the robot is in front of the wall. That is how you model that this, the door sensor is not perfect. And if the map is uncertain, which means if the, if the position of the doors is uncertain, then you can model this by a higher uncertainty um, in this detection sensor. Make sense? I'm trying to figure out why you need to use multi parallel methods here. Couldn't you, in this case, just solve the integral numerically? Um, you learned a very high dimensional space and. and oh, in, in this particular example, yes. Maybe then you could use, um, maybe, for example, multi hypothesis tracking approaches like that. But I'm going to show right after this slide, I'm going to show some real world applications of that. This is just a schematical description of it, how it works in principle. And I wish give some examples for real data. So, and for each of the observation of the robot, you first weight the samples and then um, draw new samples from the sample set according to the weights. Now I want to show you some examples with samples. Um, what you see here is a two-dimensional, again, a map of part of the computer science department um, of the University of Bonn. And those gray areas correspond to obstacles in the environment, such as walls or desks. The blue arrow here indicates the path taken by the robot. And in the beginning, the robot does not know where it is. And this um, uncertainty about the robot position is represented by these uniformly distributed red samples in the whole environment. These samples are three-dimensional, so what you see is just a two-dimensional projection of them, so they include the orientation of the robot as well. And what you will always uh, also see at each iteration of the algorithm is the position of the robot projected on the estimated position based on the sample set, which does not have to be the correct one, especially in the beginning. And those blue lines here indicate the, the sensor measurements by the ultrasound sensors of the robot. So this is um, real data collected by our robot, and um, what you will see is the sensor information that is used for position estimation. Okay. So in the beginning, the robot or the samples pretty quickly concentrate on the hallway because there the probability is much higher to make those kind of observations. And here you can see the nice property of those sample sets is that they are well suited to represent such ambiguous situations. So the hallway is symmetric. And at that point in time, there was no way for the robot to determine whether it's at that position looking upwards or at that position looking downwards. And as the robot moves into the room now, based on the different furniture in the rooms, it is able to uniquely find out where it is. Another application of this with a completely different kind of sensor, what you see here is a ceiling map of the National Museum of American History. So this map or this image is about 67 meters wide. And what, you, what, what we did was we um, put a camera on the robot and the camera was pointed to the ceiling. And as the robot moves around, you can put those images together to get one big mosaic of the environment. So the white spots you see in here are the ceiling lights. And now the task of the robot was again to find out where it is. So it moved through the environment, it had the camera pointing to the ceiling, and from each camera image, we extracted the average grayscale of the center of the image. And if you have this grayscale, then it can be matched against this map of the environment. Again, we will have the red samples, and the robot actually moves from up here down through the center. And you can see that the samples concentrate more and more on this position of the robot. And 
and this works even though the sensor information is very inaccurate because it's only based on one grayscale. Okay, now I want to come to the problem of multi-robot localization. So let's assume so you have several robots in the same environment. And the idea now is that maybe the robots are able to help each other finding out where they are. In this example, imagine you have one robot, which we call Marion, in this um, lab of Carnegie Mellon. Um, and this robot knows exactly where it is, which is represented by these blue samples over here. And there's another robot, which we call Robin, um, that just moves down the hallway, but it does not know where it is. And this uncertainty is represented by these red samples. And the idea now is that if the blue robot can detect the red one, then it might tell it where it is. And how we um, implemented robot detection is given on this slide. So each robot was, um, we put a red green marker on top of the robot so that the detection is pretty easy. And if you, and from this um, marker you can um, extract the relative bearing of the robots. And if you combine this information with a laser scan taken at the same point in time, then you can extract a pretty good image on where the other robot is relative to the first one. And um, if you want to implement this, this multi-robot localization scheme, the question comes up how you um, represent the belief state of the robot. One idea would be just to put all these um, three-dimensional belief states into one big belief state. The problem is that the dimensionality of this belief state um, increases with the number of robots. And therefore, the, um, the complexity of the estimation problem grows exponentially with the number of robots. In order to get around this exponential um, growth, we um, make the assumption that you can represent the belief state of the robot um, in a factorial way, which means in a sense, each robot performs position estimation just the way I described it. And when one robot detects the other robot, then these belief states are constrained given the detection event. And um, taking this into account, now the um, robot localization algorithm looks as follows. In the first two cases when a robot moves or senses, it just performs localization exactly the way we had before. The only difference is now that I uh, included the index of the robot number and the index of time. So these two are exactly the same as if the robot would be on its own. What is new now is the case when one robot is detected by another robot. And in this case, the belief of being at a location L is changed proportional to, this, to the probability that this robot is at a position L given that the other robot that detects it is at a position L prime and detects it with this um, random variable R. And we also include uncertainty in this detection. The, the problem if we want to implement this scheme is now we have two sample set. Let's assume this sample set for example. But to integrate it we need um, a density which means we need for example to know what the probability of this robot being at that position given the blue samples. And we cannot extract this information directly from the samples. But to do so, um, we use um, density trees, which uh, means we extract a tree representation from the sample set. And the tree finally would look like this here, which means um, the discretization of the space is proportional to the number of samples in a certain area. And given such a tree, you for each point in this area, now you can ask what's the probability of the robot being there given this tree. Now I show you one example run. This again is, is real data, it's not simulation. So we have the one robot, Marion, um, operating in the lab. It knows exactly where it is. And the other one, the, the red robot, performs global localization and it moves down this hallway. And you can see that in the beginning, the samples concentrate more and more along the main axis of the hallways. And now the robot is detected by the blue one. 
And this detection event is used to represent this new sample set which shows the belief of the blue robot about the red robot's position. And then we extract a density tree from that. And this density tree is used to uh, perform important sampling for the red robot. And then finally, as you can see, the red robot knows exactly where it is. And we performed uh, 10 experiments of this type where one robot was sitting in the lab and the other one performed global localization. What you see here is um, on the x-axis the, the time since the beginning of an experiment. On the y-axis the estimation error which is given by the average distance of samples from the true position of the robot. And the red line is given by the evolution of the estimation error over time if the robots don't detect each other. And the blue one is given if um, the robot in the hallway is detected by the other and this detection is integrated into the, observa uh, into the sample set. And we also performed experiments with, with eight robots performing global localization at the same time. And we also got a um, highly significant increase in the performance. So this approach does not only work if one robot knows exactly where it is. It also works if both robots don't know where they are. Um, to sum up the localization results, um, we showed that the sample-based representation is um, highly robust to sensor noise. It allows to globally localize a robot. It allows it to recover from failure, which I haven't shown you. Um, recover from failure means imagine the robot moves through the environment. It knows exactly where it is, and someone picks it up and puts it to another position. And the robot has to be able to find out um, that it has been moved and to determine its new position. This is what people call, also call the kidnapped robot problem. And uh, the Monte Carlo um, representation is highly efficient, especially compared to the grid-based approaches that we used before. And the multi-robot localization um, significantly increases the localization performance when um, robots communicate their belief states and it allows to um, transfer information of high-cost sensors to low-cost sensors, which means if you have two types of robots and one type of robot is equipped with a very expensive, let's say, laser range finder and the other robots are equipped with low-cost sonar sensors, then the, the, the expensive robots can help the other robots finding out where they are. And what I haven't talked about yet, but that was your question, um, we also introduced sensor filters that allow mobile robots to localize themselves even in highly, dimension, uh, in highly dynamic environments. The next problem I would like to address is the one of map building. And here you can already see the, the main problem that we have to deal with. Um, what you see is, is um, raw data collected by a robot that moved through the environment um, equipped with a laser range finder. And um, at each point in time the robot took a scan of the obstacles around it and um, those different scans were put together using the odometry information of the robot. And then you get this kind of representation of the obstacles in the environment. The problem is that the robot started here, it moved through this loop and then in reality came back to the same location. But given, given its odometry information, it's 70 meters apart. So the problem now is in order to build a map of the environment we need to know the position of the robot. But in order to, to, to find out where the robot is at the different points in time, we need a map of the environment. So people also refer to this as the chicken and egg problem. And the idea here is to phrase this as a problem of um, likelihood maximization, where we try to maximize the likelihood of the map given the data. The problem here again is that um, this term gets arbitrarily complex over time because we have to integrate over all possible paths of the robot. Fortunately, there is a solution um, which is called um, the EEM algorithm which allows gradient descent in likelihood space. So what this ends up finally is um, you iterate between localization and mapping. So in one part, um, in one iteration of the algorithm, the robot estimates its position over time and these estimates for the robot positions are used to build a map of the environment. And in the next iteration, this map is used to get better estimates for the robot positions. 
And finally, this approach converges to a local maximum in likelihood space. And I just want to show you here an example of how that um, works over time. So here we assume a robot can detect landmarks in an environment. The robot moved down the hallway and then came back, but finally it came back to this position. But based on the data it has collected thus far, this would be the most likely map. Now the robot detects another landmark and still this would be the most likely map and we can see that this is not correct. But as the robot gets more information now, the most likely map finally looks like this, which is topologically consistent. And as it gets more data, we get this type of map. And once you have a topologically consistent map, you, you can do local scan matching to get a very accurate um, description of the environment. And then you can come up with such a kind of map here, especially compared with the raw data. Um, how much? Hmm? Ten? Oh, great. And here's just another map. Again, this again, the Smithsonian Museum now not given as a ceiling map, but as an occupancy grid map. Um, yeah, one nice example that uh, Sebastian Thrun now just came up with is, um, imagine now you have a robot that can build a map as I just showed you. And what we did in this example, we put a laser range finder, a second laser range finder on top of the robot. And this range finder, at the, as the robot moves through the environment, it kind of took slices of the environment. And by doing that, you can get a three-dimensional image of the environment, not just a two-dimensional one. And if you additionally put a video camera on top of the robot and a panoramic lens, which you can see here, then you can put um, these camera images on this three-dimensional map, and finally you can come up with a description like that. This is data taken by the real robot. But still, you should have in mind that this is kind of raw data. So there's no symbolic representation of what could be a wall. But I think this already gives, gives a nice um, direction in which this kind of work can go in the future, where you try to get richer representations of the environment. Okay, now I want to come to a mobile robot control. And the first task is the one of active localization. Um, thus far, localization has been purely passive. So this kind of position estimation just um, provided a scheme on how to integrate sensor information so that the robot estimates its position. But it didn't tell you how to control the robot so that it can find out where it is. And here's just one typical example. Imagine again, this is the hallway environment in Bonn. The robot is placed in the hallway and it moves up and down the hallway. And what happens after some time, it knows exactly it's either at this end of the hallway looking to the left or at the other end of the hallway looking to the right. But by staying in the hallway, it will never be able to find out where it is. And the idea here is um, to guide the robot to places in the environment so that it can uniquely find out where it is. And we use a greedy approach where the robot chooses um, actions based on um, the immediate utility and cost. And an action in this case is given by a target point relative to the current robot location. So we have a two-dimensional search space for actions. Here's just one example of an action, which means move to a location nine meters behind and four meters to the left. And in our example, this action might carry the robot to this point or to that point, but we don't know which one of those it is because the current position of the robot is not known. So it is important to realize that the target points are relative to the current robot position. And from this two-dimensional search space for actions, we choose the one that maximizes utility and cost. And utility in this um, case is given by the um, decrease in uncertainty about the robot position. And in this case, we can um, easily compute the uncertainty in the robot position by the entropy of the belief state. And what this equation does is nothing else than um, computing um, how more certain will the robot be about its position after it moves to a certain location and after it fires its sensors. 
So the utility again is given by the decrease in uncertainty that we expect. And the cost of actions are given by the cost optimal path to this target location. But in order to compute that, we also have to consider that the robot currently doesn't know its own position. And here's one um, example experiment using this approach. So the task of the robot was to move to location A. It was placed in the, in the hallway, but it didn't know its start position. It, it, it could also have been for one in the rooms, but in this experiment, it started at position one. So in the beginning, the robot typically um, performs some kind of random motion or wall following. And at that point in time, it decided to move to the end of the hallway. Because at the, at the end of the hallway, with its proximity sensors, it was able to detect its relative position to the ends of the hallway, which kind of reduced the uncertainty only to two possible locations, just as we had in the example. And when it was here, it decided to move to the room to its right, which could have been either room B or room C, but in this case, it turned out to be room B. And in this room, it moved up and down until it uniquely found out where it was, and then finally, move down to room A. And we performed um, 20 experiments of this type with our approach and um, in each of those cases was able to localize the robot and random navigation failed in nine out of 10 um, experiments just because um, it, it didn't succeed in moving the robot into one of the rooms. Okay, um, why did, so in this example, if you look at, for example, those blocks here, so we indicated the robot that it was not allowed to move into, for example, those rooms by, by blocking these doorways. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that's tricky. So what you see here is um, the kind of, these blocks told the robot that for the cost, it wasn't allowed to move there, but um, it, was, it did not know this, the actual state of the doors. So imagine you want the robot to find out where it is, but you tell it, but don't move into this room, no matter whether the door is open or closed. Okay? But if the robot knew that the goal say couldn't be in a room that it couldn't move into, that would have been enough, I suppose. Oh, but, if, but it didn't know the state of the doors. It was only told, don't move there. Okay. okay? Question? Yeah. So you pick an action by computing the utility and the cost for every possible action. Yeah. And every possible action is moving to every every possible position. An action is to. moving to a relative position. Yes. Right. So, but you do a complete search over everywhere it could go to in the environment. Yeah. yeah. Which is not really efficient. So you can certainly get better better results by using this um, kind of maybe a Voronoi description of the environment. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. It's certainly. then it would have done exactly that by moving into this room A because that's a 50-50 and then trying to find out, yeah. Um, but this was specifically designed to show um, that, that cost, taking the cost into account is very important. So, I still was not percent sure, so how would the random navigation perform in that situation? Um, yeah, in that situation it almost failed in all because it just didn't move the robot. So you can, given an environment, you can always come up with a nice, you can hand code a kind of nice strategy so that it, on average, nicely finds out where it is. But, um, um, and, but for each strategy, you can find an environment where that doesn't work. And the advantage of this approach is that it works in any kind of environment. It just selects the best places, given the environment, given the belief state. So is it true what you're saying is that uh, you rigged this in a way so that it wouldn't go into A first by saying you can't go into those upper rooms, so the actual cost of going into A was quite higher. Otherwise, if you left those doors open, it would have gone into A first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this was for our, to make it look more interesting. Yeah. Basically. 
Um, yeah, right. Because if there was a 50% chance that this or that door would be blocked, and only had to uniquely find out where it is so that it can really move through that. I have a question. How, oh, how yeah. fast is this overall? Are you, are you so the whole experiment is about, like, let's say, 12 minutes. Okay. So a person could do it. Computing faster. everything. And I was just curious okay. if you raised a person against the robot, the person would be faster. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, yes. <laughs> okay, so I will skip that um, and come to the conclusions. So in, in we found out that, that these probabilistic methods are well suited to deal with sensor noise and to deal with the uncertainty that you have in the outcome of actions. And especially the sample-based representations have been shown to be very robust and efficient, um, and especially compared to, to previous approaches that were used in this context. And these probabilistic methods provide means on how to control a mobile robot so that it um, can achieve a certain task. And I believe that these problems do not only hold for these mobile indoor robots, but also for other kinds of embedded systems. Um, my future work, um, I want to continue some work in this multi-robot scenarios. So for example, I'm currently working on a multi-robot mapping where you put several robots in an environment and they all start building a map of the environment and you try to generate one consistent map of the environment. So the robots do not know where they are relative to each other um, and they have to find out over time how to, how to put these sensor informations together. And um, we found out in the museum especially that human robot interaction will be extremely important for the future applications of mobile robots. And that would be interesting to um, collaborate with people working uh, in the area of, of computer vision, for example, gesture recognition, and um, speech recognition will also be very important in future applications. And then those two points, symbolic representations and integration with high-level control system, kind of get together. So what I showed you um, up to now, for example, all the maps were, in a sense, purely sub-symbolic. So they told you um, that at a certain position in the environment, there is with high probability an obstacle, but there was no information of what type of obstacle this is. And I think it will be extremely important also to extract symbolic representation of an environment. So um, with that we can reason about doors and not only obstacles. And um, at the same time, how can we integrate these low level probabilistic methods with high level control system that up to now mostly use um, or ignore uncertainty in the outcome of actions. And I want to continue working on real world applications. And here's just one short example that we are currently working on at uh, CMU together with University of Pittsburgh. Um, this is, okay, I'll just show you quickly. This is called from the project NurseBot. Oh, you don't have sound. So you see, they get more and more intelligent, those robots. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the task of this robot, in, on the long run, will be um, um, a robot that is supposed to assist elderly people in their home environment so that they can stay longer at home before going, for example, to a nursing home. So assist, assist them during their everyday life, for example, reminding them of taking their medication or providing an interface with the physicians. Thank you very much. Thank you.